Today we are going to be testing food hacks and whatever the hell this is. Food hacks are sometimes great. The good ones often come from chefs facing down a tedious bunch of work. They come up with an ingenious way to maintain the quality of the food while cutting down on the time it takes to prepare it. Others are not so great. These are presented as thinking outside the box, but they often don't meet the level of quality or ease of making or preparing something traditionally. Today, I'm going to be looking into seven popular food hacks and I'll be rating them with the season liberally rating system. Meh, eh, or yeah. Let's jump right in. Okay, these come from shelfcooking.com. The first one reads, use a waffle maker to make perfect golden hash browns with minimal effort and cleanup. Now, when I first saw this, I was immediately intrigued. First thing I thought is that if it could get hot enough to crisp it, you'll have more crispy area because of the peaks and valleys. So I made multiple batches of hash browns. I shredded these both with a hand grater and a food processor. I removed as much water as I could, seasoned the potatoes and taste them to make sure the seasoning was correct, and then added them to the waffle iron with pats of butter on each section. I cooked four batches, each at a longer interval. They were okay. I think the pros are that you can throw these on a machine and, and let it do its work and not have to babysit it. The potato was all the way cooked through. The cons are that the crust on the potato was not as robust in both color and crunch as one you can achieve in a pan. So these are minor quibbles, I know, but I don't think they're as good as the pan version. So this one, it gets an eh. The next one reads, make your own breadcrumbs when you're in a pinch and run out. I do this all the time and I would go a step further than the food hack. Make your own breadcrumbs all the time. If you're in a household that has bread, then breadcrumbs from fresh bread taste a lot better than store-bought breadcrumbs. One thing that's harder to do is get it as fine as store-bought, but I never really had a fineness issue with any of the recipes and they taste better. Store-bought taste a little stale, they just do. Panko breadcrumbs may or may not be worth buying if you need it for a specific recipe for the crunch, but you can also recreate panko breadcrumbs by putting fresh breadcrumbs on a cookie sheet and setting your oven to 200 degrees. Put these in the oven and let them dry there for a bit. The time will depend on your batch, but check them every five minutes starting at 10 minutes. You want them to dry and not brown. If they look like they're browning, they're done. This one is an emphatic yeah, with an addition that you should just do this all the time. Next one says, peel garlic easily. Remove all cloves from the bowl by applying pressure with your hand and rolling it around until they come apart. Then, using a large chef knife, lay the flat side of the blade on the clove and give it a good whack with the palm of your hand. You'll be able to easily peel off the skin. This is the method you should use all the time. I do this no matter how much garlic I need. Also, I have one of these little rubber sleeves that are made for rolling and then the paper comes off. But again, I have to cut the root off anyway, and the knife is in my hand, and it only takes a second to smash it. And also, I don't have to wash something else. The other way is to take a bowl with a lid or a, a larger jar with a lid and cut the root's end off and drop the garlic in there and shake it. This method can be hit or miss, but it's useful to know if you have a ton of garlic you need to peel. You may want to give it a little twist to get the paper to come off, but it still comes off pretty easily. This one is a definite yeah. Okay, here's another one I do. Keep a large line bowl handy when cooking and throw any scraps into it. This makes for easy cleanup, especially if your trash can isn't handy. And I do this all the time. I've been doing this for years. I always keep a scrap bowl near me so I don't have to constantly walk over to the garbage and clean off the cutting board. Now I don't line mine because it's just creating more garbage. The only way I would line one is if I had like a compost box and the liners were compostable and then I could tote the scraps outside. But you can just 
walk outside and throw these in your composter or, you know, if you throw them in your garbage, you can throw them right into the garbage and then clean the bowl. So this one is a yeah, but lose the bag. Next up, save your chicken or turkey bits and bones to make your own broth. This is great, but I will warn you that turkey stock has a much more unique flavor than chicken stock. So be warned that if you mix the parts, you're basically making turkey stock. It's gonna overpower the chicken. I do save the backbones of any of the chickens I spatchcock and I make stock with that. They freeze well and after I have four or five of them, I make a great stock out of that. You can also use cooked bones from a roast chicken to make bone broth as well. Save your roast chicken bones and then when you have about two chickens worth, you can cut up some celery, carrots, onions, throw a little oil on that and roast it in the oven. And then you could just add that along with the chicken bones to a pot with some water, a bay leaf, peppercorn, some parsley. And you could cook this over low heat for several hours on the stovetop. Or you could put it in a pressure cooker for an hour on high pressure and let the steam release naturally. Cool your stock in your fridge and you can easily remove the fat from the previous day. While this doesn't have as much body as normal stock, it does have a lot of flavor and body, and it's a great frugal way to get more food out of what you buy. So emphatic, yeah, here, do this. Okay, next up. Shred your chicken in a stand mixer or with a hand mixer. It's so much quicker than doing it by hand and so much easier. Do it while it's still warm and it'll shred easy peasy. Now this is something I had never done before. And let me tell you, it works. I did both cold and warm and the warm definitely worked better. I also think that the shredding was kind of uneven and some of the pieces were longer and others were grounded dust. So if I wanted to present this, I would probably shred it by hand. But if it's just a filling and you know you need a lot of it, this is a great method. Definitely a yeah. Okay, so the one you've been waiting for. Use a bunt pan to cook a whole chicken. Stand the chicken up and fit it over the bunt pan center. Add potatoes and root vegetables to the pan and season the chicken well. Bake at 425 degrees Fahrenheit until a meat thermometer reads 165. Now, I am presume they're talking about the breast meat there. A couple of things right away. This is kind of modeled off the beer can chicken where you take your chicken and you put it in an open can of beer and it sits up. There's a couple of problems here. One is that there's a hole in the bunt pan. So you have to put another pan underneath it because things will drip down through here. The other problem too is that it sort of widens out as it goes down. So as you put it in, it sort of stretches the chicken out, especially as it cooks and as it presses down. And it also just does an okay job of crisping the skins on the top and back of the bird. But the bottom here just sits in the juice and it's not getting as direct heat from the oven. So it, it, it looks gummy. Okay, as for the chicken, this thing, this thing looks, it looks violated. I mean, the poor chicken died for us to have a meal, and the least we can do is not this to its body. Looks more like a prop from a vent horizon than dinner. You basically have to cut the bird up anyway to present it. You're certainly not going to bring it to the table like this. So why not just spatchcock the bird? It cooks more even, and the skin cooks all over. This, this is just wrong. And it doesn't make the chicken taste any better. In fact, it was sitting up like this. Half the breast meat just tasted drier than the bottom half of the breast meat. Huge, emphatic nah on this one. So big thanks to shelfcooking.com for putting together that list of food hacks. There's 35 of them on there. I certainly didn't get to all of my plan on doing some as time goes on, different episodes on different portions of that food hack list. Also, this is not me trying to disparage this website. They certainly went through a lot of trouble to put these together. And this was only my experience working with these particular hacks. Uh, probably other people in other kitchens might have totally different experiences. If you have a favorite food hack website or a food hack list, please leave it in the comments below. I really do love this stuff because it shows that you can challenge traditional methods and come up with a better, easier method. So I'd really love to see any that you find. Please like, share, subscribe. I know I say that every time, but there's a bell there. Go ahead and hit it. Come on, go on. I'll wait. We're gonna be back next week. Until then, season liberally. Oh,